would like to start the next panel on by uh, Professor uh, Jackie St Jacqueline Stone. And um, let me introduce briefly. And uh, uh, Professor Stone is a professor of Japanese religious, uh, religions at Princeton University. And we all know that, uh, so I don't really go into the uh, her, uh, introduction. And she, uh, her, um, she is the author of Original Enlightenment and the Transformation of Medieval Japanese Buddhism. And uh, uh, recently, she has uh, produced uh, uh, quite uh, many books, and uh, including the the, uh, the most recent one is the Reading of the Lotus Sutra. And uh, today, uh, we I, I'm I'm also I'm, as a historian of modern Buddhism, I'm very excited to hear the, her. Um, a keynote lecture on uh, modern uh, Nichirenist movement. And so I'd like to, um, and also uh, uh, today we have two uh, kinds of uh, handouts by uh, Professor Stone and also by Professor An Hayashi. So I'm sure you have, you all have the handouts. And uh, uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, Professor Stone, I mean that. And uh, the, her uh, paper is on uh, modern nationalism and the, the reconstructing of the Nigerianist identity. So, Thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, Professor Williams and the uh, Center for Japanese Studies for this highly stimulating conference. I am somewhat of a medievalist uh, sightseeing in the modern period, so I, I hope that those people who are specialists in this uh, time period will uh, help me. Central to the study of Buddhism in Japan's modern period is the question of how Buddhism and nationalism have interacted. Scholars have begun to analyze how Buddhist ideologues of the time accommodated their tradition to the needs of nation and empire building. Less well explored, however, is the Buddhist side of Buddhist nationalism. Buddhist leaders not only reinterpreted their religion to serve the modern state, they also invoked the modern state to serve the truth claims of their religion. Keeping both aspects firmly in view helps undercut overly simplistic or one-sided assessments of Buddhism as merely an ideological tool of modern nationalism and also draws attention to the complex ways in which Buddhist and Japanese identities influenced and shaped one another. Uh, today, I'd like to consider some aspects of this process with examples drawn from Nichiren Shugi, or Nichirenism, a movement known for its nationalistic readings of Buddhism and ideological support for Japan's imperial ventures. Accounts of this movement typically begin with Tanaka Chingaku, who coined the term Nichiren Shugi, and in 1880 founded the organization Renge Kai, uh, later renamed Risho Ankoku Kai, and then again Kokchu Kai, to promote a lay-oriented, socially active Nichiren Buddhism. Tanaka moved proselytizing out of temples and into public lecture halls, and several of his innovations, such as youth and women's groups, summer training courses, and vernacular study materials have since been widely adopted by other religious groups. Another key Nichiren Shugi figure was uh, Tanaka's associate, Honda Nisho, later superintendent of the Nichiren Buddhist denomination Kempon Hokkeshu, and founder of the lay Nichirenist organization uh, Tenseikai. Uh, Honda's supporters, uh, like Tanaka's, would eventually include prominent scholars, writers, military officers, and businessmen. But here, I'd like to focus initially on Nichiren Shugi beginnings. In order to highlight the centrality to this movement, of a particular mode of Nichiren Buddhist self-definition. From the outset, both Tanaka and Honda actively seized upon the opportunities afforded by Meiji period social and political change to reclaim as fundamental an aspect of the founder Nichiren's teaching that had long been suppressed, namely shakabuku or aggressive proselytizing by rebuking attachment to inferior views or false views. 
in the 13th century, as everyone knows, uh, Nietzsche had famously asserted that now in the final Dharma age, only the Lotus Sutra leads to Buddhahood and can protect the realm. Thus, it's easy to overlook just how far Nichiren temple institutions had drifted from this stance by the beginning of the modern period. Under Tokugawa rule, laws restricted change of sectarian affiliation, and shakabuku was virtually impossible to carry out. Nichiren Shu's preeminent scholar of the Bakumatsu period, one Udana in Nichiki, had even argued that shakabuku should be superseded in this age by shoju, a mild approach to dharma teaching that provisionally accommodates lesser doctrines as skillful means. Asserting the exclusive truth of the Lotus Sutra through shakabuku, Nichiki said, was an outmoded approach that would harm the sect and provoke scorn from educated persons. Nietzsche's interpretations constituted doctrinal orthodoxy well into the Meiji period and were enlisted to support a new emphasis on Buddhist transsectarianism, or tsubukyo. Given the loss of protected status that temples had enjoyed under the Tokugawa, uh, the violent anti-Buddhist backlash following the separation edicts, and the establishment of a Shinto-esque state ideology, Many sectarian leaders, those of Nichiren Shu included, saw Buddhism's best hope of survival in transsectarian cooperation, as James Kettelar has shown. As a young man training for the Nichiren Shu priesthood, Tanaka found this accommodative stance abhorrent. Nichiren had taught that only the Lotus Sutra could protect the country, and now that sectarian affiliation was no longer restricted by law, and Japan itself was struggling to assume a place among the world's powers. For Tanaka, refuting inferior teachings by shakabuku was what the times demanded. To deny shakabuku, or to regard it lightly, is to render meaningless our school and our founder, he wrote. And he abandoned his priestly aspirations for the career of a lay evangelist. Honda, too, while remaining in the priesthood, struggled to revive shakabuku as definitive of Nichiren Buddhist identity. Both men achieved considerable success, not only by proselytizing, but by skillfully publicizing their engagements with two sets of external critics, secular historians and Buddhist transsectarians. In 1890, and 1891, Tanaka delivered public lectures to several thousand auditors, denouncing what he called the outrageous errors of two prominent secular historians, Shige no Yasutsugu and Ogura Shukan. Shige no had recently published a paper uh, denying the historicity of the tradition that Nichiren had narrowly escaped beheading by Kamakura Bakufu officials when a terrifying luminous object fortuitously streaked against the sky just at the critical moment. Uh, this was, Shigeno asserted, a fabrication of later followers. Ogura had similarly claimed that contrary to tradition, Nichiren had not predicted the Mongol invasion. In his rebuttals, Tanaka publicly excoriated Nichiren temples for failing to rebuke the slanders against the Dharma represented by Shigeno and Ogura's arguments and called for a restoration of shakabuku. A league formed of like-minded members of Tokyo-based Nichiren Buddhist lay societies numbering some 7,300 supporters. Honda Nisho similarly promoted a return to shakabuku via a prolonged public confrontation, not with secular historians, but with ecumenical Buddhists. In particular, the Bukkyo Kakushu Kyokai, or uh, Trans Buddhist Transsectarian Committee, which in 1890 had launched a project to publish the Bukkyo Kakushu Koyo, or Essentials of the Buddhist Sects, under the editorial supervision of Shimaji Mokurai. Uh, this work was to embody the spirit of the new Meiji transsectarianism 
And each major denomination had been invited to submit an essay outlining its fundamental doctrines. Honda wrote on behalf of his Nichirenshu Myomanji lineage. And in contrast to the accommodative shoju orientation, then dominating the Nichiren doctrinal mainstream, Honda's essay highlighted the four declarations. Uh, these are slogans said to summarize Nichiren's criticism of other schools. Nembutsu leads to the Avicii hell. Zen is diabolical. Shingon will destroy the country. And Ritsu is treason. Unsurprisingly, uh, a substantial sections of Honda's submission were rejected by the editorial board as incompatible with transsectarian aims. Uh, Honda filed suit in the Tokyo courts and parlayed the resulting controversy into a nationwide movement among Nichiren Buddhists for the revival of Shakabuku, forming the Toitsudan, or Unification League for this purpose, in 1896. So in this way, uh, Tanaka and Honda publicly defined their stance over and against both secular approaches to Buddhist history and the Meiji period emphasis on a shared Buddhist tradition. By the turn of the 20th century, they had begun to win significant support from mainstream Nichiren Buddhist temple sectarian organizations. Now, why did Tanaka and Honda deem Shakabuku so important? Its aim in Nichiren Shugi parlance was unification, toitsu, of all Nichiren denominations in a single sect, of all religions within Nichiren Buddhism, and of all human activity, society, ethics, and politics on the basis of the Lotus Sutra. This totalizing vision was first laid out in Tanaka's 1901 Shumon no Ishin, or Restoration of the Nichiren Sect, a manifesto for sectarian reform and blueprint for world conversion. Using charts and graphs, Tanaka projected an increase in Nichiren Buddhist adherence from 3 million to 113 million over 10 five-year periods. The sect itself, he predicted, would come to dominate the national infrastructure by building railways, shipping lines, and extensive financial networks. Institutionally, as well as ideologically, the entire apparatus of the modern state would be subsumed within Nichiren Buddhism. Tanaka stressed especially the unification of Buddhism and government, or Obutsu Myogo, invoking Nichiren's prediction that someday the sovereign and his ministers would embrace the Lotus Sutra and decree the establishment of the Hommun no Kaidan, or true ordination platform as the sacred center for all people of the world. Under the modern political system, Tanaka reasoned, the mandate for building the kaidan would have to come from the diet. And winning enough sympathizers in both houses would require converting a majority of the populace by shakabuku. One by one, Tanaka predicted other religions, acknowledging the superior righteousness of the Lotus Sutra, would declare their own dissolution and convert. Within 50 years after the implementing of his proposed sectarian reforms, the whole nation would embrace the one vehicle. At that time, the Diet would pass a constitutional amendment abrogating freedom of religion, making Nichiren Buddhism the state creed, and formalize the merger of Buddhism and government by establishing the Kaidan. At that point, Tanaka predicted, the authority of our teaching will instruct the people of all nations, accomplishing the spiritual unification of the world. And he envisioned the progress of conversion efforts abroad on a map of world unification, uh, giving the locations of projected Nichiren Buddhist culinary, colonies and missionary bases across the globe. Shumon no Ishin represents the first detailed plan for what I have called Lotus modern Lotus millennialism. And two points about Tanaka's agenda are particularly worth noting. Uh, first is the reciprocal but unequally weighted relationship of Dharma and nation. Uh, Nichiren Buddhism in his vision will certainly benefit Japan, but Japan's whole raison d'etre is to serve the worldwide spread of Nichiren Buddhism. Second, Tanaka intended his plan to bear fruit in the foreseeable future. 
While Nichiren himself had predicted the realization of a Buddha land in this world through the spread of faith in the Lotus Sutra, for most of his followers over the next six centuries, that ideal had remained vague and remote. In contrast, Tanaka's Lotus Millennialism entailed a concrete social and political agenda. World spiritual unification, he wrote, was not like heaven or the pure land, which are never actually expected to appear before our eyes. We predict, envision, and aim for it as a reality that we will definitely witness. This sense of immediacy would be a crucial factor in later conflations of Lotus millennialism with Japan's expansionist aims. So let me turn now to some interactions of the Lotus millennial vision with modern national ideology and the modern imperial enterprise. From around the time of the Russo-Japanese War, Tanaka found himself in competition with a rival unifying principle that increasingly dominated public discourse, uh, the kokutai, or Japanese national essence, the ideological pillar of the Meiji state. In response, Tanaka set about elaborating an entirely new branch of Nichirinist doctrinal interpretation that he termed kokutaingaku, a subsuming of the kokutai within the Lotus Sutra. In so doing, he drew on time-honored strategies of traditional lotus exegesis, notably the principle of opening and integrating, kaie, or revealing the correct aspect of incomplete expedient teachings by reconciling them in the one vehicle. As long as it remains separate from the wonderful dharma, then it's nothing more than the kokutai of Japan, he wrote, but when opened, or grounded in the fundamental truth of the lotus, the Japanese kokutai would become vitalized and benefit all humanity. Nonetheless, even with the resources of traditional Buddhist hermeneutics, the kokutai proved a rather large categorical object to digest. Uh, kokutai gaku included elements quite foreign to traditional doctrine, including the official mythos of state Shinto. Tanaka drew, for example, from the Nihon Shoki, three phrases describing Emperor Jimmu's achievements, fostering righteousness, increasing glory, and accumulating happiness, identified these as the three acts that had established the Japanese kokutai in primordial time, and then equated them with Nichiren's three great secret dharmas, the object of worship, the daimoku, and the ordination platform. Attempts such as Tanaka's to incorporate state ideology into a Nichirenist interpretive frame inevitably changed the interpretation of Nichiren doctrine, drawing it ever closer to the national ideology it was intended to subsume. And this dynamic underlay the multiple versions of Nichirenist, Nichiren Buddhist pan-Asianism that emerged in the Taisho and Showa periods. Ex exponents, uh, adherents of Nichiren uh, pan-Asianism included Fuji Nittatsu, founder of the small ascetic order Nipponzan Myohoji. Uh, Fuji proselytized in China, Manchuria, India, and Ceylon. Uh, Takanabe Nitto, head of Nichirenshu's proselytizing mission in Mongolia. And perhaps most famously, Tanaka Chingaku's disciple Ishihara Kanji, operations officer of the Guangdong Army, who was instrumental in the so-called Manchurian incident of 1931 that helped precipitate the 15 years war. All these figures understood the imperial project in terms of modern Nichirenist millennialism. They were by no means the only Buddhists to envision a Japan-led Asian unity grounded in the Buddha Dharma that could resist and ultimately triumph over Western hegemony. But once Japan's colonial enterprises were filtered through a Buddhist hermeneutical lens, a Buddhist interpretive lens, Nichirenist ideologues were able to draw on elements specific to the Nichiren tradition that facilitated a merging of their particular Buddhist vision with the nation's imperialist aims. So let me touch now on a few of those elements. 
first was Nietzscheman's prophecy that the true dharma of the lotus would someday rise from Japan like the sun and return to the West. In its own time, Nietzsche's assertion may be seen as one of several medieval attempts to invert Japan's marginal position vis-a-vis -vis India and China in the hierarchy of Buddhist countries. In modern Nietzscheanism, however, this prophecy of the Dharma's return to the West was mapped onto imperial expansion, thus acquiring both substance and immediacy. Fuji Nittatsu, for example, saw Nichiren Buddhism as instantiating a spiritual civilization of the East, capable of uniting Asia against a culture of violence and materialistic greed that he associated with Europe and the United States. An independent practitioner not officially connected to the colonizing mission, Fuji nonetheless saw his proselytizing on the continent as a first step in fulfilling Nichiren's prediction. If this dharma does not return west, our founder's prophecy will have been in vain, he wrote, and our bodhisattva practice will not be fulfilled. Japanese military presence in Asia was, in Fuji's view, to be a vehicle for realizing this aim, a conviction that underlay his offering of Buddha relics to the imperial army and navy in the late 1930s. <coughs> Nichirenist Pan-Asianist could even claim that spreading the Buddha Dharma abroad was a task their tradition had initiated. In the person of Nichiren's immediate disciple, Renge Ajari Nichiji, a monk said to have left Japan in 1295 to spread Nichiren's teaching on the Asian mainland. Fascination with Nichiji's legend burgeoned in modern Nichiren shugi circles. Uh, Tanaka Chingaku had proposed this torturous etymology, attempting to derive the word shaman from shamon, or Sanskrit shramana, uh, a title that Nichiren and his disciples had used to, to argue that uh, Siberian religion, shamanism, uh, must be the attenuated remains of a dharma taught to locals by Nichiji. And Takanabe Nitto, taking up his position as the head of Nichirenshu's mission to Mongolia in 1939, saw himself as continuing Nichiji's work. In the age of the gods, he wrote, Manchuria, Mongolia, Korea, and Japan had been a single country. It was Japan's destiny to reunite East Asia for the salvation of the world, just as Nichiji had sought to do in medieval times. Nichirenist Pan-Asianism was also fueled by predictions in Nichiren's writings of a great war, unprecedented in prior ages, and the advent of a worthy sovereign who chastises foolish ones. In context, uh, Nichiren was referring to the impending Mongol invasion, which he saw as retribution for Japan's collective error of slighting the Lotus Sutra in favor of inferior teachings, and to the Mongol ruler, who in his view had been prompted by the Buddhist tutelary deities to punish Japan for this offense. Uh, Nichiren Shugi exegetes, however, read these statements as prophecies of events to come. For Ishihara Kanji in particular, the unprecedented Great War would pit the rapacious West against a Japan-led Asia in an apocalyptic conflict culminating in Japanese victory then the world, at last united in the Lotus Sutra, would enjoy a reign, of priests, a reign of peace under a worthy sovereign who would sponsor the Homo no Kaidan. As an instructor at the Imperial Army Staff College, Ishihara struggled to develop a timetable for this event that would bring into alignment Nichiren's prophecies, variant Buddhist eschatological chronologies, and the unfolding Japanese military involvement in Manchuria and China. Ishihara's Nichirenist Pan-Asianism was marked by an intense eschatological urgency, and the role of his lotus millennialism in his decisions leading to the Manchurian incident is well known. Also facilitating conflation of the imperial project with the worldwide spread of Nichiren's teaching was a common rhetorical slippage in which Shakabuku, uh, now reclaimed as a Nichiren Buddhist identity marker, was increasingly equated with armed force. 
As early as Shumo no Ishin, Tanaka had declared that the lotus is the sword and Nichiren is the general of the army that will unite the world. Though back in 1901, he made clear that he was speaking metaphorically. The danger of such metaphors is that when real swords begin to flash and real armies are on the march, the metaphor and its referent easily collapse and their identification is no longer symbolic but literal. Uh, an early 1916 example appears in the work of uh, socialist revolutionary uh, Kita Iki, a lotus devotee briefly within Tanaka's orbit. Kita had asserted that in this age, the Buddha had appeared as the Meiji emperor and clasping the eight scrolls of the Lotus Sutra waged compassionate shakabuku in the form of the Russo-Japanese War. And uh, similar rhetoric, rhetoric uh, proliferated over the ensuing decades. Uh, so I'm coming up to the conclusion here. Uh, through interpretations of the kind that I've tried to outline here, the spread of the Lotus Sutra and the extension of empire eventually merged in the Nichiren Shugi religious imagination so that Nichiren's predictions appeared to legitimize Japanese territorial expansion and imperial expansion seemed to be fulfilling Nichiren's prophecies in a mutually validating hermeneutic loop. I think Nichiren Buddhism has always offered followers a strong sense of historical agency in its claim to be the sole form of Buddhism efficacious for this age and destined to one day save all people. For most of the tradition's history, that one day remained a vague future goal. But once the spread of the Lotus Sutra became conflated with actual territorial gains, that one day became now. And until the horrific costs of the imperial project became undeniable, we can imagine that Nichiren Shugi's more committed devotees must have inhabited a world of preternaturally heightened meaning in which the aims of their tradition seem to be materializing before their eyes. One more paragraph. How religion and nationalism merge is a complex problem, one by no means confined to 20th century Japan or to Buddhism. Uh, today, I've attempted to shed some small light on that dynamic uh, using Nichiren Shugi as an example. In a totalizing religious vision, such as that of modern lotus millennialism, all events are filtered through a single hermeneutical lens. For those who embraced that vision, Japanese identity was mediated by their identity as Nichiren Buddhists, and Japan's emergence as a colonial power could not be understood apart from their Nichirenist interpretive frame. This was no mere expedient compromise of Buddhist teachings in the national interest, but a far more complex interpretive process. Uh, which is why I began this talk by arguing the importance of recognizing the Buddhist part of Buddhist nationalism. But ultimately, the two elements cannot be readily disentangled. The hermeneutical frame of modern Nichiren, modern Nichiren Buddhist doctrine was irrevocably changed by what it was invoked to interpret. And for those who wholeheartedly embraced it, Buddhist and national identities became inseparable. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Stone. And I would like to quickly uh, ask uh, Professor Hayashi to start uh, to make uh, uh, comments on uh, Professor Stone's uh, lecture. And before that, I would like to uh, introduce uh, this uh, and a flyer, uh, which is located, uh, which is, uh, you can find it at the, like, uh, yes. uh, this is about Nihon Shisoshi, uh, uh, the special issue on uh, modern Buddhism, and, uh, and, uh, and also edited by Hayashi Sensei and a uh, uh, young scholar, uh, Otani Eiji san. And uh, also, uh, Suyek Sensei is contributing uh, one of the uh, essay on which is very interesting article. So uh, you can, uh, after the, uh, this panel, uh, please uh, find a, uh, get a copy of this uh, flyer. And so 
。で、次に林先生のご紹介をしたいと思います。えっ、ー、と。まあ、林、あ、いいですね。あの、まあ、林先生、あの、まあ、陰陽道の研究でよく知られていますが、近代仏教の。研究でも大変、あの、刺激的な、あの、内容の、あの、発表や、あの、論文を、あの。提供してくださいます今日は、えーまあ、ストーン先生のご発表に対するコメントをいただきますそれではよろしくお願いしますありがとうございました、えー、それではあのこれからあのちょっと入ってもいいですかね、えー、ストーン先生のご発表に対するコメントをさせていただきたいと思いますで先ほど紹介していただきましたあの林と申しますで私はあの、えー、江戸時代の陰陽道とか暦を、まあ、あの専門にしてまして近代仏教を専門にはそれほどしてないんですけど非常に関心を持っておりますでそれはですねあの先ほどご発表されました玉室文雄先生が会長をやられてます近代仏教研究会というのに18年前、えー、設立するのに立ち会いましてでここにもおられますあの木場先生それとか安中先生と一緒にですね研究会をやってきたということがございます。まあ、あの海外の方でもジャフィー先生とかミシェル・モーア先生もあの長く会員をされて、えー、おられます。で安中先生がいつも事務局をやってますので、えー、もしこの期間、えー、この研究会に入りたいという方がおられましたら、えー、スペシャルディスカウントでですねあのあの入れると思いますのでもう安中先生はもう歩く近代仏教研究会で彼が全てやってますから彼に直接こう、えー、頼んでくださいであの先ほど紹介してもらったこのコマーシャルもこれもスペシャルディスカウントやってますのであの値段がいく,らい,くいくらになるかというのはちょっと個人的に交渉次第になりますのでコーヒーブレイクの時に交渉してくださいそれではですねあの私のコメントを始めたいというふうに思いますであのお手元にこの紙があると思いますこの両面印刷のこれを読みながらあの私のコメントを終えたいといいとう,うに思いますで私の,あのコメントは3つに分かれてまして、えー、先ほどストーン先生があの話された内容を私なりにもう一度話をし直すということをして2番目に私なりの評価をして3番目に3つ質問をするというあの非常に論理的な構造になっております。<笑>で初めにですね、えー、私の理解した範囲で、えー、ストーン先生の論文の概要を紹介したいとでストーン先生は田中知学本田日照藤井日達石原寛治北一揆などの近代日蓮主義の系譜を広く展望しつつ、えー、どのようにして仏教と国会流浪儀とが関係しているのかを注意深く読み取ろうとしていると、えー、1ページ目のところってこれはあのストーン先生の論文のところなんでここは皆さん方分かりにくいかもしれませんけど、えー、ストーン先生は仏教仏教的指導者が近代国家に奉仕させるために自分の宗教を再解釈するだけではなく自分の宗教真理に奉仕させるように近代仏教に働きかけたということに注意を向けておられます。でそしてこの、えーえー、両面的な複雑さつまりまああのー、自分を近代国家に奉仕させるっていうのと近代国家を自分の宗仏教的に例の実現のために奉仕させるとそういう二重のところをですね、あのー、複雑さを、まあ、あの視点に入れた点はあのー、というふうに研究すべきだというふうにストーン先生は提案されております。でその中でストーン先生は「近代法華ミレニアニズム」と。いう言葉で大変刺激的な言葉でですねこの内容をまあ提案しているというふうに思います。であの読者はこの論文を、まあ、今日の話を聞いているうちにそれが非常に有効な概念であることが分かってくると思います。で近代田中知学の近代ホッケミレニアミズには2つの方針がありました。で第一には今申しました仏教的法と日本との関係であると。えー、日蓮仏教は日本に奉仕、日本は日蓮仏教の世界的拡大に奉仕すべきだというものであると、でそれ第二に、日蓮の予言の成就は、長い間、あの日蓮宗の中では曖昧にされていたけれども、それがついに現実となる時期が迫ってきたという認識であると、まあ、これがまあ私が理解したストーン先生の言う、近代、ホッケミレニアニズムだと思います。で日露戦争後田中知学は釈仏を復活して国体と仏教は仏教的法の一体化した思想を広げたと、えー、広めたと、えー、日蓮主義の系譜から藤井日達の反アジア主義石原幹事の終末論が生まれて現実の政治にも影響を与えたことがここで説明されております
。でストーン先生は、えー、近代、えー、北京日蓮ミレニアニズムには、えー、メタフォーの、えー、危,険危険性、えー、解釈学的なレンズがあることを指摘しています。でそこにです、ね、解釈の過程というものに、まあ、注目されていると私は思いましてでそれゆえに仏教的ナショナリミズの仏教的面を、えー、認識することは大切だというふうにストーン先生は説いているんだろうというふうに思います。つまり私は、まあえー、後でストーン先生がどう言われるか分かりませんが非常に解釈という点を強調されていると。そしてその解釈の面があるからその仏教というものがこう近代に入り込んでくるということをおっしゃっているんだろうと思います。でこれに対する私の考えなんですけれども、まあ、近代ホッケミレニアニズムという新しい用語が果たしてですね他の研究者も使えるかどうかということにかかっているんですねこの発表は。でこのその近代ホッケミレニアニズムという言葉を他の研究者も共有して使えることになるとこの今回の,あのストーン先生の,あの発表は成功している。といいううふうに私は思いますねですからこの用語にかかっている有効性他の研究者がだからそれはあの他の研究者がどうこれを使っていくかということなんですね。でストーン先生の場合は解釈の過程があることを示したことが重要な示唆であるということは間違いないと。であのケテラーさんのですねあの本がありますけども、えー、ずいぶん前の本がありますけどもそれは明治仏教の解釈の過程を、えー、明らかにした。とということですけれども、えー、ケテラーさんの本のです、ね、残念なことは、えー、明治時代で全ての物語が終わってしまっているというところがあります。で、まああのーまあ、ケテラーさんの場合はあのー、明治仏教が異端から徐々に殉教者になり最後は通仏教化しコスモポリタンの仏教になるという非常にですねサクセスストーリーを書いてるんですけれども。えー、明治の後あのコスモポリタンになった仏教がその後大正昭和になんで国家主義になっていくのかっていうのは彼は一番あの弱点じゃないかと思いますしストーン先生も確か批評でそういうことを昔おっしゃってましたですよね、えー、言ってると思います。で私はこのストーン先生の研究っていうのはケテラーが閉じてしまった明治で閉じてしまった近代仏教の幕をもう一度ですねそれ以降、えー、大正、えー、昭和に続くものとして、えー、一連主義というのを捉えることによってですね、えー、あの後付けることができたのではないかというふうに高く評価しています。それでまあ三つの質問という形で私の質問をしたいと思います。でまず一番目ですけれども近代仏教と西洋との関係についてということです。えー、島島くらいは西洋の宗教観に照らして浄土真宗が非常に一神教的であり、えー、文明の宗教であるということをまあ主張しました。これはまああのフランスから帰ってきた後にそういうふうに主張するわけですね。でまた浄土真宗はいち早く西洋の教育制度を取り込んで僧侶養成に普通教育をまあ取り込みました。これは最近の谷川あの豊さんの本,本が出てますけれどもそれがそういうことを明らかにしています。でこのように浄土真宗は西洋の宗教観、えー、教育制度を持ち込んで近代化を図ったそういう教団です。で鈴木大説はアメリカにおいて全東方仏教の価値について次々英語の本を書いてアメリカの読者を引きつけることに成功しましたで禅は鈴木大説のおかげで、えー、西洋にこれはアメリカにと言った方がいいかもしれませんけども読者を持つことができるようになったのですでここで私は何が言いたいかというと、えー、浄土真宗も禅もですね、えー、西洋とのコンタクトによって近代化の道を歩んだというふうに言えるでしょうそれではですね、えー、日蓮主義の近代化の場合にはですね西洋とのコンタクトというのはいかなる影響を与えたのでしょうかあるいは与えなかったのでしょうかで浄土真宗禅の近代化は、えー、と同じように西洋とのコンタクトによって、えー、仏教の近代化の道を図ったのかあるいはそれとはもう一つ別な形の近代化の道をたどろうとしたのかということをですね、えー、お聞きしたいと思います。えー、ケテラーさんはですねえー、先ほども言いましたけども、えー、明治仏教通仏教で説明しようとしたんですねで通仏教化していくということを言いまして、まあ、それをさらに言い換えてコスモポリタンということを言ってますけども今日の、えーえー、ストーン先生のお話の中では明らかにその田中知学たちは通仏教を拒否している、えー、その、えー、島々木蔵たちがやっている、えー、あの各種公用のところに入っていかないということにように見えますけれどももしケテラが言うように通仏教が近代仏教の特徴であるならば、えー、日蓮主義というのはそういう意味で言うとケテラ的に言うと近代仏教ではないのかどうかという点を教えていただきたいと
えー、むしろ私はケテラさんが言った「通仏教」って相当怪しい概念だと私は思ってますけども、えー、2番目、えー、ストー先生は、えー、仏教的指導者が、えー近,代仏えー、近代国家に奉仕させるために自分の宗教を再解釈することこれは私は A とこれはストーン先生じゃなくて私が呼んでるんですねで自分の宗教心理に奉仕させるように近代国家に働きかけたというのが B というふうに私は呼んでいるわけですね特に B の面を強調されたように思いますしかしですね、多くの仏教教団のナショナリズム化は A だろうと思うんですね、他の教団は。自分の教団を国家のために保持させる、だから日露戦争のところに時に従軍曹として送り込むとかですね、やってると。まあ、そういうことはやるけども、えー、果たしてですね、B はですね、他の教団はやったんだろうかという疑問があります。つまり、えー、日本国家を自分の日蓮の教えのために奉仕させるという考え方はあったんだろうか、私は日蓮主義のことは分かるんですが、おそらくなかったんだろうというふうに思うわけです。で、えー、そうすると、この B っていうのは日蓮主義のみで例外的なものなのか、あるいは近代仏教に一般化できるなのか教えてほしいと言ってますけれども、これは実はですね、ストーン先生が今日提起されました、近代ホッケミレニアニズムという言葉についてですけれども、近代浄土真宗ミレニアニズム。近代総統宗ミレニアニズムがあるかどうかという問題にも関わるわけですね。で私はないと思っているんですけどもではなぜですね、えー、いやあ,れあるという議論をストーン先生がされたらまたそこでは違いますけどももしないというふうに私は思っていてストーン先生もそれを、えー、賛同されるならばなぜ日蓮主義からのみそのミレニアニズムというのは出てくるのかという大きい問題があると思います。それは、えー、日蓮の時代にすでにその日蓮の仏教というのがミレニアニズムの要素をはらんでたのかあるいはそれ,でそ,れでそれが近代に復活しただけなのかあるいはミレニアニズムというのは田中千学が作った近代の創造なのかという点を教えていただきたいというふうに思います。3番目はこれは重要なことですけれども日蓮主義の本については先ほども紹介しましたあの11月に出るすみませんもう一度。何度もコマーシャルするんですけど、この本、一緒に私と変者やってる大谷さんの本で、えー、これはまあストーン先生もお友達だと思いますけれども、大谷さんの近代日本の日蓮主義運動という非常にいい本があったと思いますけれども、えー、ストーン先生は、えー、今回の、えー、研究の立場からして、大谷さんのこの本に対して、どういう点に、えー、今からすると批判ができるのかというのを教えていただきもし批判ができるんだったら次のステップが我々には見えるかもしれないというふうに私は思っていますどうもありがとうございました Thank you Professor、uh, Hayashi Thank you very much Hayashi Sensei for your stimulating comments which are going to allow me to expand beyond the、uh, framework of the paper First of all I think we, we need to distinguish a little bit between、uh, Nichiren Temple Organizations and Nichiren Shugi. This is a compl complex issue. They, they overlap but are not exactly the same.、Um, Nichiren Shu is a temple organization, is very active in proselytizing. This is an, an answer to the question about contact with the West.、Uh, Nichiren Shu is quite active in、uh, proselytizing、uh, abroad, also imports、uh, aspects of Western education into the training of priests. And I want to defer both of those topics、uh, to Annaka Sensei, who is much more of an expert、uh, than I am.、Uh, but in And, and of course, Tanaka from the, the Nichiren Shigi side is a real modernizer in some ways, as Richard Jaffe has written. This is the man who gave us Buddhist weddings, and very technologically savvy in, in coming up with、uh, really innovative ways of proselytizing. But in general, I believe that Hayashi、uh, Sensei is right. To my knowledge,、uh, we don't find either Nichiren Shu or Nichiren Shigi leaders who seek to engage Western intellectuals in the same way that、uh, Suzuki did,、uh, nor do we have this mass dispatch of. Promising、uh, young priests to study abroad with great Orientalists,、uh, as in the case of、um, Honganji.、Um, so,、uh, this、uh, leads us to the important point, a very important point, I believe, that there is more than one narrative of Japanese Buddhist modernization. Uh, Tsubukyo is one such narrative, and I think it's very important、uh, for the Meiji period. 
uh, James Kellar tells a wonderful story in that book, but how much of a success story we can say that Tsubukyo is from a long range perspective, I think is um, open to question. You know, in Meiji, uh, Ikeda Eishun identified two, more than 220 pan Buddhist groups really important at that time. But when we get into Taisho Showa, I, I'm not sure that we can, can say that Tsubukyo is the only uh, narrative or is definitive of Japanese uh, Buddhist uh, modernization. Another narr uh, narrative of uh, modernization, which is not confined to Japan or to Buddhism, is the uh, revival of doctrinal fundamentalism and ancient prophecies in connection with national projects. And we can see that in the newspaper. You know, it's not confined to uh, modern Japan. Uh, and this is uh, what we see in the case of uh, Nichiren Shugi, uh, which brings us to this issue of uh, lotus millennialism. I actually used the term for the first time in an essay published in 2000. So maybe it's already failed because no one picked up on it. Uh, I'd like to stress that I'm not using the term millennialism in the narrow Christian theological sense here, uh, but in the broader religious studies sense to denote an aspiration for realizing an ideal world on this earth, not merely through human efforts at social uh, amelioration, but through some sort of spiritual or religious power. And no, I don't think that we have Jodo Shinshu millennialism or Zen millennialism. This is something that comes about in one quarter of modern Nichiren Buddhism uh, due to the fact that we have these prophecies uh, within Nichiren's writing that I think quite fortuitously um, seemed relevant, or see, just seemed to have a relevance and an immediacy that they had not had previously. I don't think we can really call Nichiren himself a millennial thinker. You know, he does say that, uh, yes, someday through spread of faith in the Lotus Sutra, there will be, you know, ideal rule, ideal society. But, you know, Nichiren headed a, a, a group of maybe 300 followers. You know, he knew it was going to take time. Uh, so we, we don't really see a strong millennialist thread in Nichiren himself, but really I think 1901 Shumon no Ishin marks the sort of formal birth of, of what I'm talking about as uh, lotus millennialism. Um, moving on to the uh, question of the two sides of uh, Buddhist nationalism, um, I, I don't think that, you know, whether one stresses the nationalist side or whether one stresses the Buddhist side, I, I don't think this falls out along sectarian lines. Uh, of course, in every sect, uh, including Nichiren and Shu, uh, there were people for whom Buddhism seems primarily to have been a vehicle for promoting national or even personal self-interest. Uh, but there were also many people, again, I believe this is across sects, just not, not just Nichiren Shugi, but across uh, Buddhist denominations, who at the same time were both ardent patriots and also devout, deeply committed Buddhists. And I want to take their Buddhist commitments seriously uh, for a couple of reasons. In, in stressing this Buddhist side of Buddhist nationalism, uh, I want to argue against two standpoints. Um, one is that I think uh, many historians have not yet adequately taken account of the importance of the role played by religion in modern nationalism. Again, this is not just the case of Buddhism in Japan, but I, I think that if we look at Buddhism solely as an ideological tool, uh, we can overlook just how important uh, Buddhism or, or indeed any other religion has been in, in the rise of some forms of modern nationalism. And Secondly, uh, I'm really interested in this question of how doctrine gets reinterpreted under changing social circumstances, and thus how it plays out in social practice. And there is a kind of a tendency that we see both in practitioner circles, but also within scholarship, to think that um, if only we understand Buddhist doctrine correctly, if we just get it right, that it's then going to be impossible to apply it in a way that's morally misguided or harmful or violent. Uh, so by that kind of understanding, Buddhist nationalism is already, almost by definition, a distorted form of Buddhism. 
And I think the issue is a lot more complicated than that. So that's one thing that I'm trying to uh, get at, is I want to think uh, more seriously about how commitments to national and religious identity intersect and influence each other. And the third question about Otani Sensei's uh, book, I really don't want to criticize it. I want to bow before it. If you saw my personal copy, it's all marked up and has all these post-its. It's a wonderful, exemplary piece of well-documented research. But if I had to say one thing, and I'm hesitant to say it, because you know somebody writes a great book, and then someone comes along and said, oh, but you should have done this. Mm -hmm. um, I think where we go now, and that's not a criticism of him, but Korekara no Kenkyu, he focuses um, on Tanaka Chingaku and Honda Nisha. I think he was reacting against Togoro Shigemoto, oh. who defined Nichiren Shugi as anything that vaguely you know, happened from the 20th century on and had anything to do with Nichiren, it's Nichiren and Shugi. So in Otani Sensei's book, we get a, a much more closely defined look at the role of Tanaka and Honda, who are, of course, uh, essential to this movement. But from now on, I, I would really like to know more about the networks that form, and especially the, the interaction between, you know, in 1901, uh, Tanaka is so critical of the Nichiren Temple organization, but then there seems to be some sort of rapprochement, and they're sort of cooperating on some level. So how does Nichiren Shugi, lay Buddhism, interact with the temple organization? And then you get these peripheral figures, like people like Kita Iki, or you know, Inoue Nisho, or people who are vaguely influenced and are using the rhetoric, because Tanaka's rhetoric goes way outside of Nichiren Buddhist uh, circles and is quite influential. So a broader perspective is what I'd like to see from now on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Stone. And uh, I, we are uh, a little bit running uh, out of time, but uh, I'd like to uh, one. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, one or two questions. Uh, okay, please uh, use that microphone for the interpreter. Temple University. And thank you so much for a great presentation. One question is that. Uh, Nichiren Shugi as a vehicle to justify the imperialism, pan-Asianism, but also I'm wondering, uh, Senogiro in 1931 is a youth federation for revitalizing uh, Buddhism. Uh, he was very uh, famous for anti-imperialistic, uh, anti-fascist movement. He organized. I'm wondering how would you be uh, locate his right. position under the Nichiren Shuki. And the second is uh, Fujinita's Shonin's. Uh, he was converted to Nichiren by Uchimura Kanzo's book of uh, Nichiren. And also his encounter with Mahatma Gandhi, a right. uh, non violent movement. Also, he was very anti imperialistic Narita Kuko, anti Yasukuni, anti Narita Kuko right. movement. Right. So it's not can't simply categorized as a imperialistic. Uh, that's what I would like to, okay. yeah, I'm wondering about this. Uh, for first of all, uh, Sen no Giro, I think we should really wait for Otani Eiichi's uh, work because he's doing uh, detailed research on Sen no Giro. But this is someone who starts out as uh, someone who's um, sort of a disciple of Tanaka Chingaku, but then gradually moves away and goes in a more socialist, um, anti-imperialist uh, direction. And of course is imprisoned for his views and is drawing inspiration from Nichiren to try to maintain his conviction under um, you know, very harsh uh, prison conditions. Very, very interesting figure, sort of the sole representative of the, the Nichirenist left. Um, I think also as he moves increasingly in that more socialist direction, his commitments to, to Nichiren may become attenuated as well. Fuji Nittatsu is a very interesting figure because as you mentioned, uh, after the war, he becomes an absolute pacifist in the Gandhian sense. And Nipponzan Myohoji is famous for this literal reading of the first precept, not to harm life. And they're very, very well respected for their anti-nuclear stance, anti-imperialist stance. So uh, yes, I mean, he's unlike Tanaka, he survived the war <laughs> and had to sort of revise. Uh, but it's very interesting, there was an exchange that may be an overstatement, uh, but between um, 
Fuji Nitatsu and Togoro Shigemoto, mm -hmm. where Tokoro is saying, this is a flip-flop. You, know, you completely inverted your stance. Mm -hmm. Whereas from, Fuji, from Fuji's position, at least according to what he wrote, he felt that he had always been striving for the propagation of Nichiren's Buddhism for the sake of world peace. And he did say that after he saw the you know, very impressive statement, that after he saw the nuclear devastation, then he realized that, OK, there has to be a, a stand against war. Um, so there is uh, that perspective from which, you know, from an outside, outside standpoint, it looks like he reversed himself. Uh, but he also saw a perspective from which there was continuity between his pre-war and post-war stance. Ranjana is uh, doing um, research on, on uh, Fuji Nitatsu. I think we can expect a lot. It's going to be great. OK. Um, maybe just one question from, OK, Annaka sensei. Be the last one. すみません、日本語で安中でございます。あのたくさん名前を読んでいただきましてありがとうございます。<笑><笑>あのまあ、質問の前にあのちょっと皆さんにお願いというか、あのまあ、先生じゃストーン先生もおっしゃってましたけども、えー、前近代の日蓮宗と近代以降の日蓮宗っていうのはかなり大きな違いがございます。あの他の宗派えー、浄土真宗ですとか曹洞宗そういう宗派での前近代のに、えー、それぞれの宗派の位置づけというのはそんなに大きくは違わないと思うんですけどもその日蓮宗に関してはその前近代と近代以後の日蓮宗というのは大きな違いがございますのであのちょっとこれを一緒にしてはいただきたくないですあのただそれを説明しますともうあの何時間もかかってしまいますので<笑>え今はあのそれだけお願いいたしますであの質問というのはあのまあ釈伏少女少女釈伏えー、それを近代、前近代として、えー、分,けられる分けることができるかどうかをおちょっとお伺いしたいと思います。Um, thank you. It's an excellent question. I'm not sure we can.、Um, in a sense, you know, Nichiren starts out as a marginal figure.、Uh, he engages in shakabuku and insists that、uh, the Lotus Sutra is the only teaching relevant for this time period and all others must be rejected. And that was a stance that, of course, constitutes doctrinal orthodoxy, but it's very difficult to institutionalize. So throughout the medieval period, we can trace a pattern where new lineages really assert hardcore shakabuku as a way of establishing their legitimacy, but then more established Nichiren temples tend to become more accommodative. Uh, under the Tokugawa, of course, shakabuku has to go underground. It's just not going to be possible to do that.、Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting that at the beginning of the modern period,、um, Arai Nisatsu, uh, uh, um, who is a disciple of Udana Inichiki, the scholar I mentioned at the、uh, beginning of my talk, who said that shakabuku is no longer、uh, appropriate for this age, was the, the head of the, the Nichirenshu temple organization. And he was a strong supporter of transsectarian Buddhism as a survival strategy. So the Nichirenshu mainstream sort of starts out、uh, in support of this shoju approach. Then you have people like Tanaka and Honda coming out of the woodwork and saying, no, now the time is the legal restrictions have been removed. We can revive shakabuku. So, in a way, that's modern. I mean, the way Tanaka does it is modern, but it also recapitulates a very old pattern in which people within the Nichiren tradition who are starting new movements or new lineages reassert shakabuku as a legitimating move. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I am very, very sorry that uh, we, are, uh, we have to be,、uh, because we have、uh, m m much more to come、uh, after this、uh, session. So、uh, please ask questions after this session,、uh, panel. And、uh, I would like to ask you to、uh, give a big hand and a h a k s h i to you. <laughs> Thank you. If I could just ask for your attention、uh, for a few minutes, I'd like to get started on our、uh, lunch presentation. I know some of you are still、uh, maybe getting coffee,、um, and uh, this is an informal presentation, so feel free uh, to uh, get your coffee, and if you could then take a seat, I'd appreciate it. I'm、uh, hoping to make a brief presentation on a project that、uh, I'm helping to direct, the Mugen 
uh, project. And I hope to share with you uh, some of the things that uh, we're trying to accomplish. The Mugen project uh, aims to provide a free, online, searchable, bibliographical database of all Western language writing on Buddhism. The project received funding late last year from the Bukkyo Dendo Kyokai and the Numata Foundation to begin a 10-year project to build this database and website. The goal is to provide a tool for the field of Buddhist studies and for members of the general public to learn about what has already been uh, published, translated, and written about uh, on various aspects of Buddhism in English, French, German, Spanish, and other Western languages. On the one hand, our goals are modest. Our basic aim is to uh, simply to provide a bibliographical database rather than a full text database. On the other hand, we aim to be comprehensive with the task of creating a, an easily searchable and reliable database of every book, edited volume, chapters of books, dissertations, journal articles, and newspaper articles ever written on Buddhism in a Western language. Our hope that it will be a useful tool for researchers like you uh, to know what has already been written on a particular monk, temple, or text, or uh, what, for example, is already out there as translations of both major and minor Buddhist texts. We also hope that this will be helpful for undergraduate and graduate students writing term papers for uh, term papers, as well as for uh, members of the general public who might want to learn more about a particular Buddhist deity or a Buddhist doctrine. The project is slated to take 10 years, but we hope to make the website officially open to the public in 2011 with phase one of the project complete. Phase one involves the full searchability of the Japanese Buddhist section of the project. We're trying to cover all, all Buddhism, but the Japanese Buddhism section of the project, meaning that all records related to Japanese Buddhism should be fully entered, check for accuracy, and available for the range of search options that I'll discuss in a moment. Today, I want to give you a very quick uh, sneak preview into the main features of the website that we're developing uh, based on roughly 10,000 records of books, dissertations, journal articles, newspaper articles, uh, etc., on Japanese Buddhism that we've entered since last year. The first key feature of the site is a general and advanced uh, search engine. Here we can oops. here uh, we can enter the name of one of, say, one of our participants today, um, uh, Professor Shimazu no Susumu uh, from Tokyo, and see what comes up. And one of our features is that all these results records come up, and we can display this in either MLA, uh, Modern Language Association, or Social Science uh, citation formats. And obviously, with Professor Shimazono's publications, we all know that he has a huge publication list uh, record in Japanese. Uh, but with a search like this, we learn that he also has published quite a few works in English. If we put in uh, another tent name, uh, we just had a presentation from Professor Jacqueline uh, Stone uh, from Princeton. Why don't we put that in and see what comes up? She has not published a thing. <laughs> no, we got to get, I think it's a, it's a, we'll get the spelling right here. There's a surprise. Okay, there we go. A, mu a much longer list. <laughs> and uh, when, we, when we look at it, uh, you know, from uh, top to bottom, it goes by year uh, here, so we can see that you know it includes a dissertation that she wrote many years ago, journal articles, edited volumes, chapters in edited volumes, uh, book reviews, and so forth. And we believe that no other database available today has this kind of comprehensiveness. Uh, most tend to leave out, for example, chapters in edited books or uh, journal articles if they're written in obscure journals or foreign language journals. So this kind of advanced uh, search or general search engine is a pretty common feature of any bibliographical database. And what we hope to do with this site uh, is offer something more interesting and I think perhaps more educational as well of engaging these records. In all, 
to go back to the start. Uh, we actually offer eight, uh, it's like a Dharma wheel, so we offer eight gateways uh, into the database. Time periods, uh, trying to look at Buddhism through different time, rituals, society, geography, philosophy, tradition, so different sects of Buddhism, texts, and persons. And because of our limited time today, I'm not, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just focus on three of them. Uh, the first, let's, let's go to Buddhist uh, persons. And here, by persons, it's a very broad category. It means both monks, nuns, and lay people, but also Buddhist figures such as the full range of deities uh, in the Buddhist pantheon, such as Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Deva kings. And so, for example, if we uh, click under that Bodhisattvas and so on under, say, Jizo, we should get some kind of list of what, what is in this database about this important bodhisattva with a short uh, 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 explanation about the bodhisattva at the top of the page. And the same is true, say, if you looked at this for a Buddhist monk, say, uh, Dogen. So let's try that. And there we should be able to s Dogen. There we go. So you, again, short description, um, um, uh, some images, and you can see there's a whole, lot of other pages that if you click through, you, you, get, you get the full, full record there. But you see both writings by Dogen and writings about uh, uh, Dogen. So now let me go to a second uh, uh, gateway. Uh, another important feature of this site is to learn about Buddhism through time. Uh, and one can enter the uh, timeline um, using a a cursor, there's a, there's a kind of cursor that you can kind of move across the uh, page. Um, Trans-regionally, and you know, once we have everything from Tibetan Buddhism, Indian Buddhism, China, all of the other things, you could click on a particular year and everything would come up of what was happening in the Buddhist world at that time. Um, it, it gets linked to a particular period, and so if you go to say, let's go to Japan, because we're, we're doing Japan, um, and you move the cursor to say, 1230 or something. So that would be the Kamakura period. So if you click that up, you know, everything on the, there's some description of what the Kamakura period is and all, all these, and then you, again, the multiple, there's more, many more pages of records here. Uh, uh, and, and the same is true if you went to, uh, you know, if you went to 1870 or something, we just did something on Tanaka Chiyo. So 1870-ish, then that would be the Meiji period. So everything that's ever written, uh, ha has been written on the Meiji period should uh, come up. All right, so finally, let me say a word about um, uh, the third and last gate I wanna uh, just share with you today, uh, geography, or entering the Buddhist world through space instead of time. Uh, here we can search for specific regions and sacred sites, or say a, a specific uh, temple. So let's take a look at temple. If we go to that temple subsection and get the, uh, show the list, and say we, we, we go to a Kyoto temple, like so let's go to Ryoanji or something. Then out, we've been using Google Maps here. So out should come up. All those little flags are temples that are in the database. And then, but uh, that green one is Ryoanji. And so you see a little description and some of the uh, records there. And you can go from the map, you know, you can, you can check out, let's, that one is what, tof, Tofukuji. So if we go to that one, you can see that description come up, Tofukuji, and then you can see, okay, uh, there, uh, you have uh, the records that come up uh, of, of, of writings that have been done on Tofukuji. So that was a very quick overview, but these are the type of features that we are d uh, still in the very early uh, stages of developing. If you go back to the front, please. Uh, and and this, uh, it, we have a very, very long way to go uh, before I've, I would feel making this uh, site live or public, uh, which is why our official launch date is 2011 uh, for the Japanese Buddhism section. But especially those of you who are participating in this conference, I would really actually appreciate your constructive criticism prior to this going public. And uh, so if in the next, and well, I'll, so I'm very willing to share with you, the, you know, passwords and access codes to just get in there and play around. And if you have uh, any, uh, I would just value your thoughts on how to make this site uh, useful 
uh, for you and if you can imagine for your uh, students as well.